2019 is coming to a close, and with it, so does an entire decade. Upon realizing that we had an opportunity to look back at 10 years of gaming, we decided to embark on a long, hard journey to narrow down the best of the best pieces of electronic entertainment released in the last 10 years. Our original list started with over 100 games, but ultimately, we settled on 25. For a game to make this list, it needed to have been released after January 1st, 2010. It needed to be marketed and sold as a video game. One of the two of us had to have played it extensively. It cannot have been a remake or a remaster of a previously released game, and we both needed to agree that it stood out from a very crowded selection of absolutely fantastic games. Many deserving games were cut in the end, so it's likely that your list will differ greatly from ours. With that said, it's time to name our picks for the top 25 games of the decade. Before Valve shifted to managing a PC storefront and putting out patches for Dota 2, they were consistently putting out incredible games. One of the last ones they made would also be one of their very best. Portal 2 was a complete evolution of the formula they pioneered in the original Portal. Not only did they improve the clever dialogue and puzzle structure the first game was made famous for, but they raised the bar for puzzle games forever thanks to its robust co-op features and level editor. It's been eight years since its release, and players are still making levels for it to this day. Many games have tried to tell us that war is terrible. Most of them fail. Of the few that succeed, there is no one equal to Valiant Hearts The Great War. Valiant Hearts tells the tale of a family split apart due to the outbreak of World War I. Through point-and-click adventure-esque gameplay, you play as multiple characters attempting to survive the war in any way they can. Nothing in this game feels ham-fisted, and the humor that is there never detracts from the more melodramatic elements. With an ending that still leaves us in pieces, Valiant Hearts is not just one of the best games of this decade, but one of the best war games of all time. For us to appreciate something that is truly good, we must also recognize when something is truly, truly bad. For us to include a bad game onto this list, it would have needed to do something incredibly important and influential. As it turns out, it did. Player Unknown's Battlegrounds, or PUBG for short, is a bad game. However, we still have well over 100 hours on it. Each. This is a testament to the power of the genre that PUBG thrust onto the world at large, the Battle Royale. While not the first game to incorporate Battle Royale genre fixtures, it was the first one to really break out into the mainstream. This decade is marked by the sudden popularity of the genre as a whole, from its origins in games like Rust, to the money-sucking machines of Fortnite and Apex Legends. Even though PUBG isn't even close to the best example of a Battle Royale game, it's the one that popularized it, and despite its lack of quality, gave both of us some amazing times with our friends. Seeing a developer or publisher slowly become terrible is always a sinking feeling. Certainly, that feeling marred the early perception of Metal Gear Solid V The Phantom Pain when trailers were coming out, as the abusive relationship between Konami and Hideo Kojima was brought into public light. Thankfully, even though Kojima would move on to greener pastures, the final game they made together was nothing short of sublime. Your creativity as a player had never been so heavily rewarded before. If you had an idea on how to complete a mission, MGS5 let you play it out. 
For the first time, stealth wasn't a requirement, but instead an option among many. The game also encouraged you to use every option available as enemies and camps would adapt to your tactics if you relied on too few to complete your objectives. The phrase, do what you want, has been thrown around a lot lately, but for our money, few games embody that phrase more than Metal Gear Solid V. Most people had no idea what Nier was. All people really knew was that Platinum Games would be on the project. With the joint efforts of Yoko Taro's multi-layered scenario writing and Kaichi Okabe's brilliant soundtrack, Nier Automata crafts a bleak dystopia of an Earth ravaged by wars against machines, with humanity enlisting androids called the Yorha Forces to take on the remnants of the enemy still walking the Earth and helping the remaining human resistance on the planet. Through the shared experience of the no-nonsense 2B and easygoing 9S, the story attempts to explain multiple themes and concepts through the duo, realizing one's humanity and the human condition, rationalizing the need for empathy in a world filled with machines, and considering their purpose in the war effort as members of Yorha. Even if you've never heard about the Nier series, this game serves as a perfect entry point that will leave you wanting to explore more. Party games are a difficult act to balance. On one hand, holding players back can reduce the feeling of control. On the other hand, extremely skilled players can decide the game's winner before it starts. Steel Crate Games decided to solve that problem with Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes. One player is the bomb defusal expert, while the others feed them instructions from a free manual. It's a simple formula that's easy to understand and difficult to learn, but if your group can communicate effectively, navigating its challenges becomes very rewarding. What's most impressive about this is the game doesn't offer any tips or hints on how to work modules or read the manual, yet no group we've ever played with was ever left confused or frustrated. It's a game that thrives on player improvement and engagement, all while being aggressively inclusive and accessible. This is one party game that will be breaking out for years to come. When the King of the Jungle made his comeback in 2010 with the Wii's Donkey Kong Country Returns, critics and fans alike heralded it as a great return for one of the platformer genre's long-lost titans, long since left in the dust by the likes of Mario, Rayman, and others. Expectations of a follow-up fueled rumor mills for years, but when the announcement came during E3 2013, it didn't get the same fanfare as the 2010 revival for various reasons. While the divide persisted within Nintendo's loyal fanbase, Retro Studios got to work on crafting what is possibly the finest 2D platformer of this decade, Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze. Making its HD debut on Wii U and ported to Nintendo Switch, Tropical Freeze was a complete improvement on the original. It boasts vividly detailed levels of various locales in the DK universe, perspective shifting and mind-blowing set pieces, the return of level styles abandoned in DKCR, and 40 plus stages of increasing difficulty that continually test the player with new mechanics and clever level design. It is a game that shouldn't be missed by those who are fans of platformers, as there's a great experience lying in wait for the curious that are out there. New, flashy hardware is cool. Always has been. Even so, you still need games that show off what your cool new toy can do. Virtual reality headsets, the kind that actually work, have been around in some capacity for years, but hadn't received that one game which truly legitimized the high price point. That is until VR was graced 
with Beat Saber. It may have been daft to release a music and rhythm game seven years after the genre had been effectively gutted, but as it turns out, it's exactly what we needed. The early adopters of VR technology finally had their purchases validated with a game that anyone can understand and play in five seconds. Having to move your arms to blocks flying at your face gives you the feeling of being inside the music, something that games have been trying and failing to do for decades. Combine that with a vibrant community that makes custom maps for every song imaginable, and you have a game that could be played forever. When we were debating on whether to include Beat Saber onto this list, we asked ourselves an important question. Given that VR tech requires a beefy PC and a headset that costs several hundreds of US dollars, is Beat Saber truly worth the cost? Our answer is 100% yes. Stressful is arguably the last word you want to use when describing a video game. After all, most people play games to relax after a hard day. It's ironic, then, that the stress management genre designed to inflict stress onto the player is as successful as it is. Papers, Please is the first game with that moniker, and it's also the best. You play as a border control agent for the fictional Soviet nation of Arstotska, reading through passports and documents to decide who goes through and who gets turned away, as per the instructions given to you each morning. The real beauty of the game is the difficult choices you are presented with each day, especially since the amount you're paid each evening is linked to the number of people you see. Work fast and your family just might make it through the winter. Work too fast and your mistakes will pile up. Papers, Please is a one-of-a-kind game that never ceases to amaze us, and is easily one of the best games of this decade. Why do genres die? It's a question that's asked every time a kind of game stops being successful. Shoot 'em up games seemingly kicked the bucket when arcades started waning. And then, many years later, we were given Cuphead. What's old is new again, from the gameplay resembling a long forgotten genre to the visuals inspired by a long abandoned art style, Cuphead is a celebration of the past. Bouncy and vibrant visuals do their part in making you forget about the punishing difficulty, emblematic of its genre. There's no denying that it has left its mark on the industry, and has provided us with some of our proudest accomplishments. We're just gonna cut to the chase. Sonic Mania is absolutely amazing. It serves as an important reminder that Sonic wasn't just a product of its time, that his classic games on the Genesis aren't beloved just because of nostalgia. Everything here is a modern day improvement of what those games brought to the table, and more. Momentum is an even bigger player here, as the development team knew when to reel back the velocity just to accentuate how fast you go when the game gives you the opportunity. Some may call that wind-up time sloppy design. We say it's integral to the overall experience. Even the bonus stages are fun, something that can't be said for even the mainline Sonic games. What more could you want? Released in 2009, Bayonetta garnered high review scores and low sales figures. Due to limited commercial success, Platinum found their new property on life support with no publishers seeking to take on the reins. Enter Nintendo. The revelation that the House of Mario was fronting the cash to have Bayonetta 2 exclusive to the Wii U was the shot heard round the world. Many were worried that it would lead to a franchise stripped of its more mature identity for the sake of image. Thankfully, we couldn't have been more wrong. The sequel shaped up to be more of what people loved about The Witch, with the action cranked up to its highest yet. 
The set pieces were grander than ever, and even made waves with something as simple as Bayonetta's shorter hair. Mechanically, the ability to store combos while dodging is huge, as it allows you to finish a string even while avoiding attacks. Bayonetta 2 is a roller coaster ride from start to finish, continually building on top of its already insane foundation of character action game mechanics to give players something special. If it's just a proof of concept, even if it's less than two hours long, even if the project it promoted was ripped to shreds by an imploding publisher, PT is still the most terrifying game we've ever played. Despite being literally the length of a hallway, the amount of times we had to stop playing just to calm ourselves down can't be counted. The puzzles are so obtuse and specific, entire communities unraveled the game to its core like cult members trying to summon a demon. And as far as spooky spirits go, PT's one and only enemy is the quintessential scary ghost that all other ghosts should look up to. Konami may have done everything they could to destroy their brand, but killing Silent Hills was their biggest sin of all. Cult classics are difficult to pin down. The reason why they were never more popular in the grand scheme of things can be numerous, from failed marketing to niche appeal and everything in between. Arguably the most prevalent cult classic of this decade is Hotline Miami. It's tough to find someone that has played Hotline Miami and disliked it. The top-down mechanics are elegantly designed, requiring speed and precision in order to succeed. What's most impressive is the amount of interaction the game allows you. Doors can be slammed to stun enemies, said enemies can be rammed into walls, every object can be picked up and used as weapons and distractions, and so much more. All this is without mentioning both the fantastic surreal crime drama within the story and the absolutely incredible soundtrack, arguably one of the best of all time. Given how cheap this game is, we can't recommend it enough. While this decade opened with Super Mario Galaxy 2, the face of Nintendo dealt with an interesting departure from their usual platforming antics. The 3D platformer hadn't been the same for a while, and a return to 2D ventures only served to ire fans who wanted to hop around with Mario in 3D. Despite being a great game, 2013's Super Mario 3D World had aesthetics and mechanics that were not what most wanted. It would be another four years until Mario would return to what made his 3D platformers genre-defining experiences with Super Mario Odyssey. Boasting a mix of locales large, small, and unfamiliar, Mario globetrots throughout zones outside the Mushroom Kingdom and around the world. While the story may be the same as always, the power of Mario games lies in the ways you can move around. The cap-based mechanics take center stage thanks to Mario's new companion, Cappy. With Cappy, Mario can use their cap as a weapon, a platform, a jump extension, and to capture the bodies of enemies, friends, and objects alike. The world is designed exclusively around Mario's new abilities, to the point where pushing your skills to the limit and climbing up seemingly unclimbable walls is often rewarded with a pile of coins. Nintendo created this game as a return to form for Mario. We think they succeeded admirably.
Monster Hunter as a series has always been popular in Japan, but never seemed to break the Western barrier. Problems such as cumbersome inventory management, clunky controls, lots of loading screens, and accessibility issues were brought front and center for Capcom to see. They were slow to change, content with adding more fluff to satiate the Japanese fans. However, when they did change, they gave us everything we wanted and more. Easily one of our most played games this decade, Monster Hunter World is designed to fix several key issues that players had with previous games, all while retaining the Monster Hunter formula that made the series beloved in the first place. The gameplay loop of hunting monsters to get gear to hunt more monsters has never been more satisfying, thanks to many quality of life improvements. The inventory radio wheel makes item management a snap, armor skills are much easier to understand, the new scout fly mechanics makes looting and searching less painful, zones are completely seamless with no loading screens separating them, there's an in-game research station so you can finally look up a monster's weakness without consulting a wiki, and so much more. It's a game of small personal stories, where your own style of play is reflected by the weapon you choose, as there's 14 different styles to pick from, and all of them are wildly different. It's not often a game captivates our imagination so heavily, but this one still enraptured us hundreds of hours into the experience. Could you imagine if the fighting game series you loved had its initial reveal to say that every single character in its history was returning? With Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, the dream became a reality with a simple three-word phrase. Everyone. Is. Here. The games in the Smash Bros. series are some of the finest gaming experiences ever made, and you'd be hard-pressed to not find a group of people crowded around a Nintendo console playing some rounds to pass the time. What makes Super Smash Bros. Ultimate the best one isn't just that every character in the series is back in action, but it represents an amalgamate of splintered fans who would either latch on to the classic entries of 64 or Melee, or the more modern approaches of Brawl or the Wii U 3DS entries. Everyone Is Here speaks to every kind of player within the community, as it brought together many playstyles to coexist with more than 75 characters in its growing roster. Smash represents a continually evolving platform of video game excellence, cementing games represented within Smash as some of the best games of all time. If anything, Smash is more than just a great game. It's a symbol, a stamp of approval, a pinnacle for all games to reach, regardless of their genre. Doom is a name that carries a lot of weight. The original 1993 release brought forward what Wolfenstein created and became a household name in the process. After going into hibernation for 12 years, Doom is back and has never been better. It is a stark reminder of what made the classic shooters of the 90s so damn fun. Action that pushes you forward at every step, combined with big fucking guns. Speaking of the guns, the sound design at work is impeccable. Guns feel less like firearms and more like 10-foot cannons, making it all the more satisfying to blow holes into demons one after the other. Enemy variety and AI is also top-notch, making sure you never know what to expect around the corner. Bringing all of this together is the glory kill feature. Doom doesn't feature regenerating health. You have to pick up health packs to heal yourself, the old-fashioned way. However, there's a better method. If you get an enemy to low health, they become staggered, 
If you melee them, you get a glory kill animation, and then they drop health and ammo. This simple feature encourages you to propel yourself forward headfirst into the fray, as your aggression is rewarded with a steady stream of pickups. Seeing a shooter actively encourage momentum instead of hampering it isn't something that happens very often, and Doom does it perfectly. The next game on our list is about personal experiences and mental health. As such, Silverstone will be narrating this one, as he is the one that wrote the script for this game. My first experience with Celeste was its original incarnation on the Pico 8 virtual machine released in 2015 as Celeste Classic. I didn't think too much of it in passing, but as it was coming from creators that I loved, Matt Dorson and Noel Berry, I took an honest look and came away quite impressed. Imagine my overjoyed reaction when I heard the news of Celeste being developed into a full title by the crew at Matt Makes Games. When it came out in January 2018, my Switch and I were practically inseparable. My free time was dominated by the game, at home, on the train, and during breaks at work. While the original's gameplay remained intact, the story of the main character Madeline was what had the most impact. I understood her drive to climb Celeste Mountain, trying to prove a point to herself that she could do it, but also to conquer her perceived mental illnesses as she struggled her way to the top, encountering friendly faces, dealing with conflicting feelings, and even coming into contact with her bad side as it braided her through the story. What also adds to the game's appeal is the brilliant soundtrack by Lena Rain, evoking such raw emotion that it was almost too much to handle in the subsequent listens after beating the game. Celeste is a game so beautiful in its execution that it solidified the game proper as my personal choice for 2018's Game of the Year, and one of the best games of the last 10 years. Characters like Shovel Knight only come about once in a blue moon. Equal parts interesting and ridiculous, Shovel Knight's debut came at the right time, as crowdfunding campaigns were empowering independent developers of all kinds. Promising a 2D platformer boasting a wide array of great levels, bosses, familiar platforming tropes, and bolstered by a long list of stretch goals for future content, the love letter to 8-Bit raised over 300 grand in Kickstarter funds and saw its initial release in 2014 with the main Shovel of Hope campaign. Attaining both critical and commercial acclaim, the Shovel Knight series grew further with expansions to the base game, becoming the first third-party property to use Nintendo's Amiibo technology, crossing over with multiple independent game properties, and becoming the first indie game assist trophy in the Smash series. Shovel Knight has come to divine the full strength of independent games, becoming a beacon within the indie game scene and transforming it from a sideshow into a main attraction. The game with a million re-releases, The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim is the game that keeps on giving. Building on the foundation of the excellent Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, Skyrim takes that formula and runs with it, making everything better in the process. Character creation had never been more seamless and interesting, allowing your imagination to run wild. 
The graphical fidelity still amazes us eight years later, even without mods installed. In fact, Skyrim is possibly the most modded game of all time, outside of Source Engine games and Quake, and high demand for easy installation was one of the reasons Steam Workshop was made to work with any game that wanted it. While the dynamic quest feature was nothing more than marketing fluff, the game still offered hundreds of hours of content out of the box for a period of several months in 2011. It's almost guaranteed that you and your friends were doing nothing but playing Skyrim. Of all the games we've picked, this is the one that has been the hardest to talk about. After all, what left is there to say about one of the most hated yet celebrated games of all time? Everyone has an opinion about Dark Souls, and they're all polarizing ones. Many people abhorred it, citing overly unfair and punishing difficulty, a nonsensical narrative, lots of annoying bugs, and zones that felt unfinished. Just as many people cherished it for its clever level design, unique enemies and bosses, deep character customization, and extensive lore. Dark Souls is certainly not a perfect game, but it's hard to overstate just how refreshing and provocative the game was on release. In an era where games seemed to get so easy and simple they practically played themselves, Dark Souls threw players into the wilderness after a small tutorial and never looked back thus rewriting the book on game design. Since then, many developers have attempted to replicate what made Dark Souls great, spawning a new genre in the process. Nowadays, it's impossible for From Software to release a game without the internet going crazy with discussion about difficulty and accessibility in games and how they intersect. Whatever your favorite in the franchise may be, the original Dark Souls was ground zero. One of the biggest features of the previous two decades was the ability for your character to be good or evil. However, it always amounted to performing actions to make a slider go up and down, usually to get specific abilities or features. Your actions would almost never have weight since resolving a mistake is just an autosave away. What we needed was a true morality system, something we never knew we needed until Toby Fox graced us with Undertale. Easily the sleeper hit of the decade, this game is a bona fide phenomenon. While the tagline lets you know right away that no one has to die, Undertale directly challenges what morality in games should be, as the opposite is also true. No matter what path you choose, the game will cleverly break the fourth wall to help you reflect on the choices you make. It doesn't hurt that all of the characters are excellent and likable, something that can't be said for many of its contemporaries. All this, without mentioning the bullet hell style gameplay that kept us engaged throughout the experience, and the legendary soundtrack that stayed with us for years. Minor spoiler for the rest of this list, but we feel that Undertale is the greatest RPG of this decade. everything gets its start somewhere. Minecraft started as a small, inspired project made in Java. As of now, it is the best-selling video game of all time. 
While the current product certainly looks very different from its humble origins, complete with much more content, the gameplay itself hasn't changed much over the years. You start by punching trees to get wood, use that wood to make tools, use those tools to make a shelter and source of light so you can hide from monsters. From such a simple and easy to understand start does Minecraft show off its power, allowing you to build anything and everything you have the time and creativity to make. We've seen players make calculators, musical instruments, Rube Goldberg machines, even entire standalone game modes using nothing more than the tools provided by the base game. Its influence and grandeur is hard to argue, given that everyone we know owns a copy of the game and has played it for many hours. Thanks to the recent revival of the game via popular YouTubers, players around the world are remembering just how amazing Minecraft is, and we couldn't be happier. When creating this list, we had to make some difficult decisions. Many amazing games had to be cut from the final list, and we'll probably be debating the final order even after this video is released. However, from the start, we knew which game would take the number one spot, and there was never any disagreement. This decade saw a smattering of fantastic games from every corner, but for our money, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild is better than all of them. We could talk about its improvements to inventory management, terrain traversal, nonlinear storytelling, incredible sense of freedom, and everything else that's sublime about this game, but you've heard all that before. YouTubers for the last three years have been talking about how amazing this game is, and they all mention everything that we could. So we won't waste your time, especially since these aren't the reasons why Breath of the Wild tops our list. Every decade is marked by a genre or feature that sums up the decade as a whole. This decade was marked by the oversaturation of the open world. Seemingly every big budget game was boasting a massive map that you could do anything in. Breath of the Wild is the pinnacle of the open world, to the point where we have a hard time playing other open world games because they don't let us do what Breath of the Wild does. They don't reward our wanderlust as well, or give us the same freedom to blaze our own trail. They don't have the same level of polish or attention to detail. Instead, they splatter your map with objectives instead of letting you explore and find them on your own. They shove a ham-fisted story in your face and force you to slog through it before you can see the credits roll, instead of allowing you to finish the game on your own terms when you're ready. Many games do some of these things very well but Breath of the Wild does everything well. Perhaps with enough time, developers will learn from this game and even create games that surpass it. But as the sun sets on the last 10 years, it's obvious to us that The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild is the best game of the decade.